Hello viewers, welcome to MOOC's online course on visual perception and art, a survey across the cultures. This is the 17th lecture and in this uh, lecture we will be discussing certain major uh, breakthroughs in visual perception that has happened in the history of modern western art. As I told you in the last class that uh, for quite some time in the beginning of modern western art. Um, when you look at uh, the paintings by Van Gogh or Turner or Monet, uh, despite the fact that their methods of depiction changed drastically and uh, seriously posed certain challenges to our normative visual perception, yet they were all working within the orbit of a normal visual representation. In 1907 onwards, we witness the emergence of a very radical art movement called Cubism, spearheaded by the famous artist Picasso and his artist friend George Braque. Now, what happened with the emergence of Cubism was that uh, though representation was an issue in their art too, but it was not a very serious issue. More than that, it was the method of addressing a certain object. In a sense, cubism was more conceptual than visual. Yet, cubist painters like Picasso, Braque and others, they certainly did a lot of paintings and later Picasso also did certain quite a few cubist sculptures and in all these paintings. Uh, which are which come under the larger category of cubism, they more or less try to depict not only what we see but also what we know. So the introduce the element of knowledge within the purview of visual representation. Now you may ask, uh, doesn't that happen also in your visual perception? I mean when we perceive something visually, do not you think that what we see is also largely informed by what we know? Exactly. In other words, the whole tradition of visual perception across the globe vary primarily because the contexts are not the same, because visual perception as we have been uh, repeatedly telling that is not a matter of simple biological phenomenon because visual perception is informed it is a very informed perception it has its own knowledge visual perception may also have its own memory it has its own habit it has its own prior experiences now this is what exactly cubist artists like Picasso and Braque are trying to take advantage of this fact that visual perception has its knowledge, visual perception is not only about depicting reality in a very realistic manner, we can in fact fragment objects into various small little fragments, we can um, show an object not as it is, but as it is known to us, things like this. Now, 1907 when Picasso came up with this very famous painting called La Demoiselle de Avio, this was known as the beginning of cubism, introducing a revolutionary change in the logic of representation as well as a revolutionary change in the logic of visual perception. Now look at this painting by Picasso La Demoiselle de Avigno. What is happening here is that though the intention is definitely representation, but then he also brings in very interesting factors like what happens to an object when we look at it not from one angle, but from several angles at the same time. Now, this can be understood as simultaneity of viewing. 
Though simultaneous viewing is not really possible in our normal course of visual perception. Because in our daily life, in our real life, we perceive a thing visually only when we are looking at a scenery or an object or a figure or anything from one particular angle. We usually do not look, we can't actually do not look at any object from multiple angles at the same time. Now this is what precisely cubist painters, particularly Picasso and Braque, were trying to introduce. That what happens finally in the painting to the forms which have been looked at from multiple points of views simultaneously. Now this is something that is absurd in real life, but it is possible in the pictorial life. It is possible in a painting, it is possible in a sculpture. So Picasso and Braque uh, together they were trying to introduce uh, an idea or an experience which is actually possible conceptually but may not be possible in real life when we uh, experience the visual world in terms of our normal visual perception. And in order to, in order to establish this new notion of painting uh, with uh, cubism as its fundamental theory, because in Braque they emphasized flat two dimensional surface and they reject outrightly any presence of perspective or chiaroscuro. In other words, both Picasso and Braque discarded this presence of light and shade and thereby creating a volume or presence of any sense of depth. So they wanted to discard perspective and things like that. They emphasized more on the geometric forms without any realistic details and cubism uh, really speaking tried to refute art as the imitation of nature. Now if, when art tries to imitate nature it is called mimetic art. We have discussed this before. Cubism refutes to be a mimetic art. Hence it refutes the whole idea of art as the imitation of nature. Cubism is conceived rather than perceived reality. And this makes it really, really very problematic in the context of visual perception. In fact, when um, cubism initially was criticized heavily um, by art critics who were outraged by this new form of painting which actually did not match with the way we would actually see the real life in real time. They, were, they felt outraged and hence they had this problem with cubism that cubism uh, not only was kind of uh, failing, in other words they were not satisfying uh, the, the expectation of a visual perception, but cubism has got nothing to do with the conceived reality. In fact, cubism had something to do with the concept of reality rather than a perceived reality and that is why many artists say, many art historians say that cubism is all about a conceptualization of form rather than a visualization of form. So, but the problem is when we are looking at a cubist painting, you can't deny the fact that we are actually looking at a cubist painting. I am not simply talking about cubism, I am actually showing you a few cubist paintings. So the act of looking is always there, even if the cubist paintings tend to discard the uh, perceptual reality, even if they tend to discard the visual perception, they cannot really deny this fact that ultimately a cubist painting has to be looked at. Ultimately a cubist sculpture has to be looked at. So here is a paradox in cubism and it is very interesting for the understanding of visual perception that when you encounter 
a cubist work. For example, you are looking at that work, no doubt about that, but it is not only looking or visual perception that is going to help you to understand a cubist painting. So it is interesting that there is an amount of looking that is going into it, because without looking you would not be able to see what these cubist painters are doing in their paintings. And on the other hand, just visually looking is not enough, because cubist paintings are not about any convincing realism. It is not even about any alternative realism. It is about how we conceive an object through not only looking, but also through knowing. And that is one of the reasons why they emphasized more on the geometric forms. And they also emphasized the fact that uh, you, uh, a representation of an object or a depiction of an object becomes really very acceptable only when you are able to show it from multiple points of view simultaneously. So, let us look at a few examples of cubist paintings painted by Braque and Picasso, though they did give titles and captions to their paintings. For example, the left one is called castle and the right one is called boat. And in fact, when you look at these paintings carefully, you might also spot some forms, some rudimentary forms of boat or castle in the paintings. But at the same time, you immediately realize that these paintings are actually not about either boats or castle. It is just a take off point for the cubist painters, but they move on to uh, a peculiar kind of painterly method, where representation takes a back seat and reconstruction of a concept visually becomes more important for them. Now, look at this painting for that matter. Of course, um, there is a title called fruit ball or fruit on table cloth. And the title is good enough to suggest that what these objects are all about. Even if we do not know the uh, title, still it is not difficult for us to identify. So, there is an element of identification here which is not difficult, but at the same time when you look at the space, the spatial organization in the painting, when you look at the background, when you look at the background object relationships, then you begin to have a feeling that probably in this painting and in other paintings of cubism, depiction of object is not their concern. Even the method of painting like the way Turner painted or Van Gogh painted painted is also not their concern. Their concern is something else and that is more to do with the pictorial reconstruction of a conceived reality. A reality that you have conceived not just by looking, but also by starting from different angles, also by observing simultaneously if possible or conceptually from different angles, different perspectives. And then you forget about representation and you begin a process of reconstruction on the canvas or paper. So, this painting by Picasso called Man and the Guitar or for that matter this painting by George Prague. I mean there are elements and objects because these paintings are not completely abstract. In fact, what happens to our visual perception when we look at abstract paintings is a subject that will be dealt uh, subsequently in the following lectures. But as of now, we are looking at certain major breakthroughs in visual perception uh, from uh, or by the artists of the most radical moments of modern art, for example, cubism. So, when Braque paints this painting and titles it as glass on a table, so, because there is a title and our mind follows the title, then we begin to see maybe a glass and also 
a circular table and all that, but very soon these identities uh, stop uh, to make any sense to us. In fact, we um, soon find out that okay, there might be a glass and uh, it is true that the glass might be kept on a circular table, but so what? Is the painting about the glass and the table? Of course not, it is about the fragments, it is about the geometrical angles and shapes, it is about the space division, it is about a most non-realistic reconstruction of a space, though there is an element of contact between this pictorial space and the real object in real life, and but that contact is very thin, very minimal and uh, sometimes it is very insignificant also. So, in fact, it becomes even more difficult for our visual perception to make a sense of it when there is a title, because the moment you read the title, you begin to expect or at least your brain begins to expect what you read in the title in the painting. And it is that expectation that is uh, completely challenged by this kind of painting. So, when Picasso has this painting ready in 1912 and it is called still life with chair caning, okay, to some extent you may identify and our knowledge of visual perception and our experiences definitely help uh, along that direction, but then after a while we understand this very well that uh, the simple visual perception is not enough, we need to approach these paintings with a different philosophical and conceptual understanding. In other words, we need to know what cubism was all about and what was the purpose. So, in this painting, for us today who are familiar with the various stylizations in painting, it is not entirely difficult to figure out that okay, it looks like the face of a man and it looks like that okay, he is wearing a coat and behind him it seems that there is a table and maybe a few fruits lying on the table, but why this painter has to show everything in fragments, why it seems that all the objects were broken apart and now the painter is trying to readjust those broken parts in a given shape, in a given space. And this makes cubist paintings very, very curious, particularly for our visual perception to make any sense. And uh, Brack also has made this kind of paintings where the figures are more uh, identifiable. But even in these paintings like this one called Large Nude by George Brock painted in 1908, the tendency is to uh, move towards a cubist statement. And then of course, we have this kind of paintings by Picasso, where the three musicians are shown in a way that we will never see them they have been fragmented, their bodies have been dismantled, they have been cut into various shapes, they have been transformed into geometry. So, it is possible that the initial impulse came from this idea or the subject matter of three musicians, but ultimately Picasso, what Picasso was exploring was not the subject matter, but the possible transformation of subject matter into geometry, into shapes, into fragments. In other words, he was creating a cubist reality out of a very, very simple subject matter like three musicians. Our visual perception got even more complicated in the wake of cubism when cubist artists uh, began using collage as a very useful medium for their project. Now, the medium of collage allowed a spatial relationships without resorting to the use of conventional perspective. So, when you paint, 
either you go for a conventional perspective system or you simply try to do something abstract and discarding the conventional perspective. But in collage what happens, because you are using real materials, because you are using newspaper cuttings and you are pasting one on top of the other. So what is happening is that you are creating not only a non-realistic space, but you are creating that space which can be perceived visually. So visual perception gets once again challenged that how to make sense of this kind of spaces which is real but at the same time not real, which is there with the real material but at the same time not there. So as observed in the collage, the glass drawn on top of a piece of pasted newspaper here could be understood as a glass actually standing on a paper placed beside a stack of newspapers without recourse to a realistic perspective. And George Burke also paints uh, a landscape in cubist methods, but now that we have got some information, some knowledge of cubism, we know that again for him and at least for this painting, the landscape was merely a pretext. What he was trying to do here is to uh, explore this idea of reorganization of pictorial space using certain cubist methods and relying heavily on geometric shapes and forms. At home, that is in India, huh, we have this very well known artist belonging to the famous Tagore's family in Calcutta called Gaganendranath Tagore, who followed this cubist methods of creating various layers of spaces. But for Gaganendranath, cubism became a very handy technique to create the most mysterious atmosphere of light and shade. Now, why I am using this example is simply because one that a particular modern language can have a cross cultural migration and secondly it can be used for a completely different purpose. The way Gaganendranath Tagore used cubism was not actually the way it was conceived initially by Picasso or Braque. Then of course we have Matisse whose painting and particularly this painting we saw in the last lecture and he spearheaded a movement called Fauvism where color dominated the visual perception. Now in real life we know color is may not be and more often than not it is not the most dominating feature. We have to at least our visual perception has to also deal with space, shapes, figuration, interrelationships between various objects and things of that kind. And then we, our visual perception also responds to color. But when Fauvist painters or Fauvism as a movement try to represent the visual reality in terms of color, when the colors became their building blocks, then what happens to the visual perception? How we deal with this kind of paintings vis-a-vis -vis our visual experiences of real life? Again, our visual perception then needs to adjust, needs to read it differently. Otherwise, one might end up thinking that most of the figures painted by Matis, they always got their faces colored or painted. It is not. We cannot read these colored surfaces on the body or on the paint, uh, on the face in Mathis painting in this realistic terms. It is something that he is emphasizing in pictorial terms, which our brain does not respond to immediately. But when we know, when we see and look at Fauvis paintings more, not only Fauvis paintings painted by Mathis, but also Fauvis paintings painted by Andre de Rain and Vlaming and others, then we slowly realize 
that it is a different notion of painting, where the building block of a painting is not really line and space, but it is colour. Through colour, you are trying to look at the world. I actually I would uh, like to um, suggest that uh, why do not you once or uh, twice try to do this. Go out, look at the world, look at the surrounding in terms of colour, come back to your room and try to imagine what you have observed with the help of colours, not with the help of shapes or forms or identity with the help of colours, colours of the dress, colours of the uh, buildings, colours of the objects. How often we remember visually a house or an interior or a gathering or a locale or any place in terms of colour? We remember objects in terms of colour. We can recall a person by remembering, ok, he wore a blue shirt that day while lecturing in the class. But how many of us remember an entire location, an entire space, an entire visual experience in terms of colour? Usually we do not, some of you might be, but usually we do not. And this Vauvis painters exactly, uh, this is what exactly they were trying to do. And then we also have uh, a movement in the early modern western art called futurist movement. And there we have this fantastic painter called Giacomo Bala, who was trying to capture the movements of paths, movements of people, movements of machines in painting and thereby not only introducing the possibility of abstraction, but also introducing a different challenge to our visual perception. For example, this one because this is not how we actually see a moving person. If the, it is this particular painting is about one single person moving across, we would either uh, in real life, we would either see uh, or feel a sense of movement and whenever we are looking at that person, we will see just one person on move. But if a painter like here uh, tries to show that entire movement across the canvas, then he has to paint the same figure several times, because that same figure was passing through all these points. Now scientifically it is true, probably our visual perception subconsciously may be also responding to this, but consciously this does not happen, but fugitivism makes it happen to our eyes. Similarly, and on a different note at the same time, cubist, I uh, sorry, surrealist painters, they were also making a visual reality um, possible for us, which is otherwise extremely absurd. This is not the way we th see things in real life. These are scenes derived from our dream life, not the waking life. These are the scenes and events and visual configurations that we might observe in our imagination, in our subconscious, in our dreams, but certainly not in real life. But look at this painting by Dali and uh, you can actually uh, figure out how continuously our visual perception is adjusting to find out the presence of different forms at the same time. We do have very simple games like whether it is a rabbit or a duck and things like that on simple black and white drawings available now on even children's books, but this is a very complex painting. Immediately it is not possible at once to find to notice that there is a dog at the same time, there is a fruit bowl and they both occupy the same space and same shape and the same form. But when we begin to look at that, it uh, clearly suggests that our visual experiences do not unfold in one register. Our visual experiences 
even in waking life and of course in our dream life and subconscious life, they unfold simultaneously at several registers. And it is this simultaneity of vision that may lead to extremely absurd exaggeration of this kind or very, very absurd simultaneity of vision and very gory and macabre uh, kind of imagination and dream as it is uh, seen in this painting or in this painting by another very famous surrealist painter called René Magritte. He uh, just makes things very absurd and very impossible by altering the scale and space relationship. So, when you keep a comb on your cot or bed, the scale that you expect them to relate with each other is not exactly the way it is shown here. Because how do we then interpret? If the comb, scale of the comb is considered to be in the real scale, then the cot is too small if the almira with a mirror on the door panels is supposed to be in the right scale, then the shaving brush on top of the almira is extremely big. So, if you believe in one reality, you have to take it for granted that the other object is or does not belong to that same reality. It is very interesting and very challenging for our visual perception to comprehend that all these objects they do share the same space, but they do not share the same reality. And it is this contradiction that makes this painting very surreal and at the same time very problematic for our visual perception to comprehend or for that matter this one. Either the fruit is gigantic or if you consider the fruit as something in a normal scale, then the room in which the fruit is kept is of course extremely small, so small that it cannot adjust anymore. Now, how does our brain initially at least respond to a painting like this? It is extremely shocking to say the least, because when you stand in front of a mirror you expect your face to be uh, seen, but instead what you see is the back of the same person which cannot happen because the, this is not the function of mirror. So, in order to play with our visual perception here in this painting René Magritte alters the function of the mirror itself and if at all the mirror begins to function in a completely absurd and different way, our visual perception is bound to get not only challenged, but crazy. Now, it is this uh, surreality, this possibility of this absurdity that the surrealist painters were trying to explore in their paintings and thereby challenging the normal the common notion of visual perception that we share every day. Thank you.